one of the things we can tell right away, um, and when I'm when I'm talking to producers about this, what I always drive home is that these calves are an asset to your farm. They should be treated with the same quality of care that your heifers are being treated with. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Luis Ferreiro. Uh, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have the pleasure of receiving Dr. Gayo Carpenter from Iowa State University. First, thank you, Gayo. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us here in the podcast. Uh, and if you could please uh, give us a brief inter introduction about yourself as well as your work, that would be outstanding. Well, thank you, Luis. I'm glad to be on. Uh, some of you might recognize my voice from the Dairy Podcast Show. So it's fun to be on the other side of the microphone, so to speak. Um, I'm the State Dairy Extension Specialist at Iowa State University. So I am our uh, only statewide specialist for dairy in the animal science department. So um, I get to spend a lot of time around Iowa and uh, working with our producers here. It's a pretty, uh, pretty diverse industry here in Iowa. Um, so that's what makes extension fun. It's a little bit different every day. Uh, I'm 60% extension and then I have a 20% research appointment and a 15% uh, teaching appointment. I coach our dairy challenge team here at Iowa State. So that's part of that. Um, and for those of you that are counting, that doesn't add up to 100%, but <laughs> we get a we get a 5% service appointment as well, which I think the academics will know um, we all do service, whether it's in our appointment or not. But I get it. I get it put in on my appointment there. So it sounds very busy. Yes. <laughs> Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonics focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. So the goal today is to learn a little bit more of what you have been working about uh, beef and dairy calves. So what could you tell us about that? Yeah, this is something that I kind of um, stumbled in on. I'd never really considered myself a calf person. I've always been more interested in lactating cow nutrition than calf nutrition. Um, but uh, here down in Iowa, we do have a pretty vibrant beef industry in addition to our dairy industry, as I'm sure everybody's aware. Um, we're probably better known for our beef production than our dairy production with with pretty good reason. Um, and so our, our beef team, uh, or a member of our beef team reached out to me, uh, a couple years ago now, or, or not quite a couple years ago now, and asked if I'd be interested in collaborating with them in some beef on dairy work. So I said, sure. Um, as, as you know, Luis and extension, a lot of times we say that we have our proactive extension or our proactive research and our reactive extension or our reactive research. And, and proactive is is the stuff that you want to do, the stuff that you're um, not that you don't want to do the reactive stuff. I maybe shouldn't say that, but the proactive stuff is is uh, what you're what you're thinking about long term in terms of your um, thinking ahead to what what the industry is going to need and what the future research questions are and that sort of thing. And then reactive comes across as uh, as the industry is changing, there's things that happen. And sometimes we need, we need questions to things that we didn't think we need questions for or answers for. Um, and beef on dairy was one of those things that really took off. Um, I'm sure anybody who's been paying attention has been amazed at the prices that people are getting for these calves. Now we were certainly surprised because we had to, over the course of this project, purchase them in some of the calves and, uh, I can tell you when we started, we were paying about 400 bucks uh, per calf for wet calves. And we thought that was outrageous. But then by the time we got to our third group of calves on this trial, we were paying $700 a calf. Oh, wow. Which felt outrageous as well. But that was actually, we've heard of people getting even higher than that. So, um, so yeah, I joined up, joined forces with the beef team to work on this and didn't think it was something I was going to uh, make a make a big splash in or do a lot with. But then as I, as I kind of got more involved and have seen how it's become such a big part of the industry, it's definitely something that we're continuing to work on, um, and continuing to explore. So, um, we are actually doing a pretty cool project where, uh, and this was the original project that, that I was reached out to about, um, we are taking calves from birth and 
tracking them all the way up to finishing. Um, and so we're doing some different interventions in early life with their diet, um, seeing if we can have an impact on whole, whole life outcomes, um, which is kind of unusual in the beef industry because there's a lot of, it's, it's pretty segmented. Um, and a lot of times, especially with these beef on dairy calves, they're shipped out from the farm and sent to a calf raiser, a grower, a finisher. And it, uh, there's not a whole lot of traceability at every stage of their production. So we're pretty lucky because we have a strong beef program as well as a strong dairy program here in Iowa that we can actually track these calves um, and steers up until finish. So the original calves that we started with are going to get are getting pretty close to ending. And so we're going to hopefully pretty soon see if we see these long term uh, long term impacts or not from early life nutritional interventions. Oh, sounds sounds very cool. Could you share a little bit of what those interventions are and what are your expectations about them? Yeah. So some of one of the our hypothesis was and still is that you're taking a calf in out of the, in the dairy industry, right? And so our replacement heifers, we know how to raise replacement heifers. We've been doing this for decades. And the way we re raise our replacement heifers from calfhood all the way up to cowhood, so to speak, is very different than how the beef industry does it. So we take these calves that were produced in the dairy industry. They're not being raised on their dams the way a beef calf would be. We're putting them into a dairy system, and then we're taking them out of a dairy system and putting them back into a beef system. But the way the beef system is designed, these calves are going to be weaned at much older age than they are weaned in the dairy industry. So we're in the dairy industry. We're weaning these calves at eight weeks. Um, we are feeding them twice a day, maybe three times a day. Some people are maybe feeding them on auto feeders. But, um, you know, we're offering them starter. They're not out on pasture. There's a lot of differences in how they're raised. And that's something that works really well on the dairy side. But if you snatch them out of that system and then put them straight into a beef type system at two months old, we can expect maybe there's not going to, they're not going to maybe adjust as well as older beef calves would. So that's kind of the hypothesis that we're working with. And there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, different interactions. Well, if we really start getting down to the nitty gritty of what those differences are, there's a whole bunch of different um, things that we could explore. So I think this is something we're going to be researching for a long time. But one of the things that we started with that we kind of kicked off with when we were first starting to ask these questions, because there's not been a ton of research done on these calves. So we were kind of we made a list of questions and almost threw a dart at the board, so to speak, and said, well, this would be a good one to start with. And what we started with is we gave two different levels of starch in the starter. So we gave a high starch and a low starch. Uh, and then once they are uh, weaned, they move over to our beef research farm. And they are either put on kind of a, uh, a hot diet, so a low roughage diet or a high roughage diet. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the whole data set for you yet because this is kind of an ongoing project. Um, but so I don't I don't really know what the happens at the receiving side because we haven't had a chance to analyze that data yet. Um, and I really don't know what happens at the finishing side yet. Um, but what I can tell you is that we didn't see a ton of differences in, in growth between um, the two different dietary treatments. I think part of the reason for that is that um, we used wheat mids to replace corn um, and to create those lower starch diets. They're pretty digestible fiber, so we think maybe that has something to do with it. Um, we think also there might be an interaction with plane of nutrition for milk replacer. So maybe you use a higher or lower plane of nutrition for milk replacer. That might make a difference. And so I've got a whole list of studies that I want to start doing after this one, because I think we came away with more questions than answers, which I think means you're doing your research, right? Oh, absolutely. But one thing, one of the things we can tell right away, um, and when I'm, when I'm talking to producers about this, what I always drive home is that these calves are an asset to your farm. They should be treated with the same quality of care that your heifers are being treated with. So I think uh, even just a couple years ago, a lot of producers would say, um, like in some of our survey data, we saw evidence that, you know, your bull calves might not get the same quality of colostrum. If there's marginal colostrum, usually that ends up going to bull calves or your beef crosses. But seeing the seeing the prices that folks are getting for these beef calves, I think it's going to there's going to be a pretty big market demand to make sure that they're high quality. And we can definitely see that just anecdotally from the calves that we get um, that that the ones that have gotten good colostrum management, you know, they're. Um, 
they're from a farm that does a good job with colostrum. They're from a farm that does a good job with maternity. Those calves are going to do well. Um, and so starting them off on that right hoof or that, that, that solid foundation is just as important for these beef calves as it is for your replacement heifers. Oh, absolutely. And certainly as the market develops, I'm certain that more and more people will become professional beef dairy producers and then learn all these strategies and move from there. And actually, I'm really curious to learn about your results in the future because, you know, um, it would be very nice to see if some of those calves with the high starch plan, uh, they actually adapt easily to a high concentrate diets and consequently can be terminated faster. So. I'm very curious about that as well. I think we have a lot of data on the dairy side. That's a really fun thing that we love to do, right? So at a University of Florida, you know, some of that heat stress research or the stuff that they've done at Cornell for the um, accelerated growth and being able to track some of these long-term outcomes in our dairy cattle. So we know in our dairy cattle that calf hood management has a huge impact on how they're going to do in their lifetime. And I'm sure we're going to find the same thing with beef. The question just is, what's the optimum? Absolutely. And any any take home message for those producers that are starting to work with some of those beef dairy calves that they could get and start implementing right away? Yeah, I think uh, so. So I guess the question I'm going to come back to your question with another question. Where on the timeline? <laughs> because there's so it's so segmented. I think beef on dairy in some aspects is even more segmented than than the regular beef industry. So um, so for the dairy producers that are that are creating these calves. Um, the, the take home message there is good colostrum, good maternity, uh, make sure your maternity area is clean and well-managed, low stress for the cow, um, making sure they're getting that high quality colostrum and the five Q's or, or however we break it down, you know, making the quality, making sure it's clean, making sure it's the right quantity, all of those, all of those things that you're doing for your, for your replacement heifers, that same level of care needs to be given to these calves for, um, in beef on dairy. In terms of, uh, you know, your buyers, uh, if they are being transported for a pretty long stretch, um, it's usually it's often a good idea to make sure they have electrolytes beforehand um, to kind of ease some of that trans uh, transportation stress. Um, we know these calves spend a lot of time on the truck, right? So in talking to some of the other people who are doing work in this area, we have we know of calves that are going from New York all the way to Iowa, and I'm sure there's calves going even farther too. So um, they spend a lot of time being trucked around the country, making sure that we make that transportation as, as limit that stress for them as much as possible. Um, and then making sure, uh, again, just that, that management is taking off the whole way through. So um, you can't out outfeed bad management, right? So a lot of times these calves getting them started off on the right way is going to come back, come back to some of that common sense management work. Oh, absolutely. So they are basically like dairy cows, you know, good management, good nutrition goes a long way. Exactly. Yeah. Sounds good. So thank you again, Gail. We really appreciate having you here in the podcast. A lot of great information. Uh, and thank you everyone for listening to the podcast. I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luis. Hey everyone, we are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.